Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, September 7, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. All right, what are we talking about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and we have quite a bit to talk about there. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, just so I don't get too sidetracked with my ADD, keep the questions on the actual slides, and then as we get closer to the live charts, or once we start on live charts, feel free to start asking questions in general there. Uh, then And then, obviously, your favorite stock picks, but wait again until we get the live charts for that. And for your benefit, ask about one stock at a time, and then hit enter. That way, I'll know which ones I've covered and which ones I did. Now, today's webinar kind of morphed into two things. And for quite a while, I've been wanting to do a webinar on patience. And I started working on that part of the webinar. And then before you knew it, it got me to thinking about becoming a successful trader and how there's no career path, which we'll get into in just one minute. And I sort of went off on that tangent, but I tried not to venture too far from the, the patience thing. So it's a combination of being patient and having a career Path. Now, before we get into all that, there's a square screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I often sum it up, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Margin call. Okay. So... When it comes to definitions as it relate to trading, I like to poke around the net and find something that's really, really makes sense relating to what we do. And the first one that came up was from the Google Dictionary, and it says, Patience is the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. Boy, that's a... That's a mouthful. That's pretty hard. And if you think about it, that pretty much defines trading. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. One of the more deeper quotes comes to mind from Leo Tolstoy. The two most powerful warriors are patience and time. Now, this is how I got into the aforementioned career path or how this webinar quickly morphed into that. Because the first thing I was going to say is, well, you need patience to learn. And as I preach ad nauseum, you have to ask yourself, how long did it take you to become a doctor, lawyer, or automatic transmission mechanic? I was speaking last year at a webinar, not a webinar, a seminar. I was actually there out in Vegas, and I meditated. It seemed a little bummed out. And we got to talking, and I'm like, uh, well, what's up? I'm just I'm bummed out. I'm not successful. I was like, well, how long have you been trading? Three weeks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You got to give yourself some time. And this person was a successful entrepreneur. And it took him a while to become a successful entrepreneur. And, it, and I tried to need him, needle him a little bit on that. And I think he failed to admit that he didn't just pop out of high school or college, whatever the case may be, and become a successful entrepreneur. He did have to work at it and struggle for a while. So you need to give yourself time. And this got me thinking about the fact that there's no career path. And that's one of the things that I got into in trading full circle when talking about psychology. Is that in any other profession, for the most part, there is some sort of career path. And I think one of the greatest examples is a plumber. And as I told the story, I think a couple times since I've uh, published a course is that we have a, a friend of the family 
and he was in a very tough business. And one day on his way home from work, he decided, you know what, I'm, I can't do this anymore. I need to do something else. And for whatever reasons, I don't know, but he decided to become a plumber. And so we called him a month or two later because we had some issues. And he's like, no, 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 it doesn't work like that. You have to study and then you have to become a journeyman where you work with someone and then you have to take tests and get a license. And it's a very long drawn out process. So along the lines of trading, I've been working really hard over the past several years to see about defining that career path. And one thing I just keep coming back to over and over and over and over and over is the amount of patience. And it's amazing how much patience you're going to need. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot of detail. But if you boil it all down, you obviously need a methodology, some money management, and of course, your mind, the trading psychology. And in more recent years, if you've been coming to these presentations, you notice that I've been harping more and more into trading psychology because the methodology is not that difficult. Or finding a simple methodology is not that difficult. And the money management is almost mechanical. When you think about it, you could money management goes on a spreadsheet. There's a little discretion here and there. And I know I owe um, one of you guys an email because we're talking about trailing stops. But for the most part, it's not that complex. In fact, that's probably the simplest thing of it all. But your mind is the most crucial part because the greatest methodology in the world with a fantastic money management system is obviously completely worthless if you don't have the proper mindset to follow it. So let's break these things down. The first thing you need to do with your methodology is find a simple pattern. All you need is one pattern to be successful. Linda Rasky once said that. And I firmly believe, and I think it was her or somebody else went on to give an example of a soybean trader who only traded soybeans on the long side. And he had these, these other parameters that he used in addition to that. But it was very simple and, what am I looking for, specific. And he wasn't trying to do everything at all times. He had one little thing that he did. Now, we all tend to go on a grail hunt, and I've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. As I say, ad nauseum, I used to wake up a couple hours early. I still wake up a couple hours early. I guess it's I guess it's the normal wake-up time now. I get up every day about 5.30. It's probably about 5.15 because my alarm clock is a little fast. So I'm up around 5.15, 5.30 every morning, and then I drag my butt in here and get started. Years ago, I used to spend those first couple of hours programming like a madman. And that's been the end of my day doing the same thing, trying to discover that holy grail. Well, the bittersweet moment for me is when I discovered that there wasn't a holy grail. And it's kind of interesting nowadays, my holy grail research, if you want to call it that, is to try to find the most simplest thing that works and just a couple of months ago i discovered something just using a a five-day simple moving average in ipos and i'll show you that in just one second and a few years prior to that i discovered something even more simpler that works and that's why on my website i went ahead and trademarked trading simplified so I would encourage you to find something simple that works. And if you want to go on a grail hunt, become successful with something very simple first. And the reason I said my grail hunt was bittersweet was because I was just doing this intense, 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 intense research. And it's sort of like when I discovered that it wasn't a grail hunt, I kind of backed off on that. But that's what I had to do. I had to back off and focus on keeping it simple. Something as simple as just following the trend. So find them one pattern. I'll give you a couple examples here 
and I'll, I'll point you in a couple directions and you could start doing this for free if you want to obviously accelerate your learning then hop into something like trading full circle and once you find something I would encourage you to go in and find at least a hundred examples historically and you want to make sure you go back in time and look over a variety of conditions if you have the data go back to the 1900s in some case sometimes I don't feel like doing whatever project I'm on and I'll go back and look at the Dow in the early 1900s and study that and look at patterns and trends and things like that going way back in time I was talking with a trader friend of mine that's probably been 15 years but it's been a while and he told me he just took this setup and I'm like wow I was like that seems kind of neat don't quite understand it but if it works for you then that's great how long have you traded it well this is my first trade it's like wait a bit when did you learn how to do this I read it this morning so it's like he read some pattern and it was a bit or a bit of an arcane pattern I tried it's a counting method and I'm not gonna get into it or throw anybody under the bus because there's a bit of a mystique around it. it's probably why this person has been successful selling this thing as opposed to trading it but that's a I'm gonna dig myself a hole here anyway he was trading this counting method system after just reading about it 10 minutes earlier that might be a slight exaggeration it might have been an hour or two earlier but you get the idea instead of going in and studying it and convincing himself through at least a hundred examples that this thing is viable he just jumped right in so what I would encourage you to do is when you're focusing on those 100 setups you want to play devil's advocate too you want to find setups that just flat out don't work and we're all guilty of a selective perception meaning that we're only picking out the ones that tend to work and that's human nature and that's sort of combined with the corollary of perceptual distortion meaning that we don't not only is our perception selective but we kind of distort what's actually there and I guess the only way you're gonna really find out is to actually do it and we'll get to that in just one second and then I would encourage you to begin to observe in real time and notice I have observe italicized so along the lines of keeping things simple I was digging through some recent weekend charts and I found a setup we talked about not too long ago in IPOs and the setup was simply to wait at least five days and then buy if the low is greater than the five-day moving average and this is why if you go back and watch the presentation I wanted to quantify something or at least qualify it to a point where there would be no questions about whether it was a setup or not and all it required was for daylight above the five-day moving average and that was to keep you from trading the IPO till day six and then it had to close at a new five-day closing high so once you had daylight and a new closing high then buy on a close now you notice I have BAB down here that's buy at B which was covered in my IPO course which was actually even more simpler than this setup and that's kind of like my goal who is it Einstein make something as simple as possible but no simpler if that makes any sense or something along those lines but you want to reduce it down to its utmost essence and see how far you can go with that so this buy at B patterns it's even even more simpler than that and that could actually trigger on the fifth day itself 
but I wanted to come up with something that was a little bit more easy to not necessarily quantify because I don't think you should take these things in a vacuum and trade them mechanically, but something that you can recognize and say, well, yeah, it definitely was a signal based on those rules. Now, along the lines of keeping it simple, maybe just trade something like persistent pullbacks or ideally persistent pullbacks with TKOs. And if you look on my website under videos, there's a, a pretty good video, if I say so myself, on TKOs. And I like combining those with persistent pullbacks or persistency, meaning that the market tends to go up day after day after day. Mathematically, that's equivalent to linear regression. But I just like to draw a trend line through as many bars as possible, as I've done here. And it's good that the, the more that are outside the top, the better off you are. In fact, we could probably move this line down. But try to intersect as many bars as possible. Or if you want, draw our linear regression line. That's fine. And here we have a bit of a TKO-ish type of setup followed by a pullback. And then this was a trigger a few days ago on that one. So very easy to see. It should be like getting hit in the head with a halibut. It should be pretty obvious as opposed to some sort of counting method where you're counting bars and you're having plotting 15th oscillators and all of these things. Now, one thing I would encourage you to do is don't reinvent the wheel. And I think a lot of us are attracted to trading because it's something that we can do and we don't need anyone else to do it. We, we feel like we want to be autonomous in this and we feel like it's something that's completely in our control and we want to do it completely by ourselves and and that's a problem that I see quite often from a psychological perspective is that people just feel like they can't ask for help and you should ask for help. And one thing I was reading recently, and I'm getting all these books confused because I'm reading a lot of them right now. I have a habit of putting a book in each different room and reading it when I go in there. But one of the things that they pointed out is even the, the best athletes in the world still have trainers and they're still learning. So even if you're accomplishing what you do, you still will be learning from others. And I think that's one thing that attracted me to, to trading is I have this thirst for knowledge. And it's a it's a difficult field to fully you, – you're never going to fully master it. And, and it was hard for me to wrap my head around that early on. But now it's just like it's actually a, a release. Like, wow, I could just keep learning and learning and learning, and that's a good thing. It'll never get boring from a standpoint of there's always more to learn. And situations are always changing. So one of the quotes that I was reminded of, and I think Einstein once said this about standing on the shoulders of giants, and it's been quoted and requoted throughout, throughout history, and the origins go way, way back. And a little poking around the Internet said, discovering truth by building on previous discoveries. Discovering truth by building on previous discoveries. It's okay to take one of my patterns and make it your own. It's okay to take one of my patterns and trade it without making it your own. There's nothing wrong with that. And it was kind of interesting, just poking around the internet a little bit, I found this picture, and they talked about, it goes way back to where, they talked about a, a midget sitting on the shoulder of a giant. And one thing about this standing on the, sh the shoulders of giants that's amazing is I've been going back and reading these vintage books 
on trading psychology and markets and market participants and such. And not just the Jesse Livermore type of stuff, but stuff that was written prior to Livermore, back to the 1900s. And a lot of this stuff is in public domain. If you poke around a lot, you can find a lot of this. So one that comes to mind is Selden, S-E-L-D-E-N. And I think I, I think I bought the Kindle version of that for 99 cents, but you could actually get the the uh, photocopied version because after so many years, I think the copyright goes away on this stuff. But it's amazing that as I'm working on this psychology course, which I might be working on forever, <laughs> the trading full circle, which is much more simpler, took me two years to complete. So this one might take me even longer if I don't stop it to go back and work on another project. But what's amazing is I want to attribute some sort of thought about trading psychology to someone. And then I'll go back and read that. Well, wait a minute. Here's this book from the 60s, such as Viewpoints of a Commodity Trader that this guy wrote about in the 60s. And then I'll read Livermore and says, well, well, wait a minute. Livermore actually said this in the I don't know, uh, in the 1900s. And then and then I'll read Selden, who said it before Livermore. So it's okay to build upon others' discoveries, and I would encourage you to do that. Now, this morning I started making a list of people who inspired me, and I realized that I would never get this presentation done if I didn't stop at some point. And here are just a few of the people who've inspired me throughout my career. And there were some people that I knew personally early on that really helped me out and some people that I was fortunate enough to meet later on that I had studied previously. So if I say something that makes sense, then use it. And if you can learn from some of these other people and it makes sense to you, then use it. You don't have to do it all on your own. And it's okay, and that's a reoccurring theme that I'm seeing over and over as I'm studying more and more of the psychology and embracing it, is that we all need help, we all get help, and we all need the support mechanism of others. And Dr. Robert Marr, which is not a trading psychology book, he's written a couple of books on psychology, which I'd recommend you read, uh, Kaizen Way and mastering fear and especially in mastering fear he talks a lot about the importance of having this support mechanism so it's okay to get help i think the trader is attracted to this business because of the autonomy but in reality it's okay to get help it's okay to consult with others obviously you have to follow your own plan and you you can't confuse your your trading plan with with someone else's and everything else you have to at some point it is dependent upon you but it's okay to have a support mechanism and along the lines of when you're finding your methodology i would urge you to beware of false claims and if if there's something out there that sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And I don't know why I'm thinking about this one particular thing, because I've seen quite a few things lately that are a lot more current. But one of them was take 10,000, turn it into to 100,000, quit your day job, and then turn that into a half a million and keep on going. Well, it's like, okay. Really, it's that easy? And then somebody asks, well, can I start with 5,000? Well, of course you can start with 5,000. So you can turn 5,000 to 500,000. And when you hit 100,000, you might as well quit your day job because that's getting in your way, right? Well, beware of these false claims. If we're that easy, then why not start, why don't they start 10 accounts with 5,000 each? And then in a short period of time, they'll have $5 million. So, but Dave, aren't you selling some education? Yeah, I'm, I'm selling education, but it's grounded in reality and reality-based. 
Now, the reality doesn't sell as well as the hype. And I got a lot of people, and this is where I get kind of pissed off, but a lot of people who are out chasing those holy grails and buying all those systems are asking me questions and asking me for help. And I could, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but I'm thinking of, it was kind of funny. Years ago, there was a guru out there, and the guru's technician was actually calling me up for advice. And I'm like, aren't you working for a guru? <laughs> he kind of mumbled a little bit. But I don't want to get in trouble and throwing anybody under the bus. But it's amazing. A lot of a lot of people who who aren't clients of mine are out chasing those rainbows and getting sucked into those inflated claims, but they won't buy in to reality of trend trading with a simplified approach, simplified money management, and having the mindset to follow it. I came across this quote in a book that I recently read called The War of Art. Obviously a little play on words there from The Art of War. But it's a good little book, and it's a you could read it in a sitting or two. And it really ties into trading, and I'm looking forward to kind of bringing some more lessons from the book into it. And I thought this quote made a lot of sense. A counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. And that's one of my, I don't know if the word's epiphany that I'm looking for or not, but that's one of the things I've discovered is that the longer you're in this business, not that you become less confident, but you become more aware that you cannot predict the future and that things are out of your control and that money management is crucial and that your trading psychology is vital and that you must follow the process and that, as Odin has said and others, outcomes are noisy. You can do everything right and still lose money. And that's kind of been my self-discovery and all this. Isn't there a Socrates quote? I'm thinking of like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Or whatever. It's like, oh, you know nothing. It's like you reach a point where you don't know anything, and then you think you know everything, and then you realize that you know nothing, but then you just accept what the market brings to you, and you follow something simple like persistent pullbacks, TKOs, or even something simpler, such as these little IPO patterns where you're buying these very simple short-term breakouts, so to speak. Now, obviously, you'll need some money management. You need to study a simple money and position management strategy that keeps you keeps the losses within reason, and occasionally a position will get away from you. It'll get gapped through, and you're going to have to deal with that, and that's just part of life while still allowing for unlimited gains. We, we hear the cliche all the time, cut your losses short, let your winners ride. And there's some truth to that. I guess that's more of an adage. If you are presented with a system, and I pick on like the so-called income producing systems because they're dangerous. I Somebody a while back, and I know I said this in a week of charts quite a bit, but Somebody a while back was teaching an option system where you sell options. And if you read on his website while he was going through an example, it's kind of like, well, you sell the option and you collect $200 by selling the option. And that's your income. That $200. It's like, well, wait a minute. Well, what if that option goes against you? If you sell an option, you become the insurance company, right? And as long as that hurricane doesn't hit, <laughs> or the shit hit the fan, so to speak, you're going to collect that premium. But he made it sound like you sell the option for $200, and now you collected $200. And as your account builds, just keep doing that over and over again. And maybe when your account gets a little bit bigger, you could do that 10 times. So 10 times 200, that's $2,000 a week. Well, it's $2,000 a week, but you also have to wait a month for that option to expire in the particular case that he was given. And, you know, as I said earlier on, 
And my disclaimer, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of shit can happen between now and then. So what I'm trying to tell you here, believe it or not, I have a point, is you want to run, don't walk away from any of these so-called income-producing strategies. The only way you can make income from a market is to take little tiny gains, okay? And unfortunately, if you read a little Nicholas Tlaib, learn about the black swan, just because something hasn't happened yet doesn't mean that it won't. And what's really tough in markets is I've seen some things work for a long, long time, 10 years, even 20 years, believe it or not, and then end really badly. So if you don't know that something really bad can happen, you're going to be really surprised when it does. And mean reversion is one of those things that I'm not a big fan of for that particular reason. Mean reversion says you could buy you should buy a market while it's just falling out of bed. Put your face in the fire is the, the, the expression they use. And that'll work until they don't. You'll catch a lot of good little moves. That and selling options is a great way to have a very brief but brilliant career, or brilliant but brief career on Wall Street. So make sure everything you're doing is conceptually correct and that you're allowing for the potential for unlimited gains and that you're limiting losses. The question is Selden. I think it's Selden, S-E-L-D-E-N. And I'll have a biography. At some point, I'll, I'll put together the mother of all is it biography? Is that the word? References? I'm trying to think of what's what's the word for it's, it's funny. You try to talk in these you, you could talk one on one, but once you go online, it's a little it's a little uh tough. But anyway, yeah, I'll, I'll get a um a list of references. Now, of course, the most difficult part of trading is you. And it's funny, like I just said, this this uh, course, when I do it, is going to be massive. But I go from this big enormity of this course, and I come back to just how simple it really is, and then I go back to the enormity of trading psychology. It's kind of like trading in and of itself. It's just sell higher than you buy. That's it. That's all you have to do is make money on trade, right? But obviously, there's a little bit more to it. Well, trading psychology is just make a plan and follow it. That's it. So I keep vacillating between the complexities and all the tangents that come with trading psychology to coming back to the plan your trade, trade your plan. And if I think of, if you had to boil it all down, the secret to trading psychology is you need to learn why we are not made to trade on both a physiological level and a psychological level. Well, the physiological level is pretty simple, and that can be explained in one page. We have a little emotional part of our brain that dates back to cavemen times, and we share it with a lot of animals, present-day animals. And that little emotional part of our brain can really muck us up when it comes to trading. So you can learn that pretty quickly. Just learn the parts of the brain, how the brain works. I think it's called the triune brain. And I'm trying to think of the guy's name. I have all, again, I have all those references somewhere, which I'll eventually uh, be happy to give you. But it's also from... A psychological level, obviously, and the psychological level is a little bit tougher, but all these things I talk about, and I'm going to mention one of them in a minute, uh, looking for action or patience, can be a problem because if you're successful, you make things happen and you don't sit around and wait for something to happen. But in trading, a lot of times you do just the opposite. So... And again, this is pretty easy to learn. There's, there's a lot of good books out there that you can read on this. And I can give you a list of probably about 100 of them, like I said, once I start putting this uh, course together, where I've 
read and reread, you know, looking for inspiration on some of these things, and then relate them back to my own trials and tribulations. Now, of course, you want to paper trade until you're successful. A lot of people don't even bother doing that, which is shockingly amazing. But keep in mind, as I wrote in a layman's guide to trading stocks, I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. And that's because it's pretty easy to follow a system until real money is on the line. Once that happens, then obviously it becomes a lot tougher. Now, I would urge you to trade at a small, almost meaningless size until successful, on and off throughout the years, not so much in the last 10 years, but going way back in time. I was involved with other websites and such, and and I would see people who were behind the scenes, not actually traders, watch the traders do what they do, edit their articles or whatever the case may be, learn the methods and et cetera, et cetera, and then they'd be like, okay, you know what, I'm going to do this trading thing. And then they have a hard time actually doing it. But in some cases, I've seen people who were successful fairly quickly, and I'm was kind of amazed like how, why did it take me so long how were you so quick and I know you had the, the benefit of these people that's a given and you could actually ask some questions and you know that's a little bit of an unfair advantage I had a bit of an unfair advantage early on some of those people I mentioned earlier I was in direct contact in the business with them and that was huge I also worked with a hedge with a couple of hedge funds but uh, one in particular was about 14 years and that helped me out a lot. But the point I was trying to make is that the people who had the knowledge and were able to apply the knowledge quickly, to my amazement, well, they said, look, Dave, I'm not trading my life savings here. I'm just taking these little bitty tiny trades and I'm only risking a very small amount. And that's a testament for you have to start off at a very small amount once you've convinced yourself through a lot of research that you have something that works and you've paper traded it and you've paper traded successfully, obviously. And then just trade a very small amount until you get the repetitions in, until you feel some of that adversity of wanting to do the wrong thing, wanting to violate that plan. And then once you are successful at doing that, then slowly increase your size until you reach the maximum of your money management strategy, whatever that may be, 1% or 2%, whatever the case may be. And that way you survive long enough to experience a variety of conditions. Now, speaking of experiencing a variety of conditions, have you experienced a variety of conditions? And that means a print money phase where you feel like God. And that can be tough. I've had people start during great times as I preach ad nauseum and quit businesses and tell a boss or tell a boss to F off because they follow the simple, stupid little simple pullback pattern, put the stop in, take the partial profits, trail the stop, follow along, and they absolutely print money. Well, what they fail to realize is the big blue arrow in the market was pointing higher. The big blue arrow in virtually all sectors was pointed higher. And then the big blue arrow with all, within all stocks within the sector was pointed higher. And that's where the permanent income hypothesis comes in. I think that's the only three words, three big words I learned from uh, <laughs> my MBA degree. But that's where the permanent income hypothesis comes in, where you're like, you know what? This is always going to be like this. Why am I wasting time with this business? This business took me, I don't know, 10, 20 years to build, and boy, it's 
taking up all my time and I got to deal with these clients and I could just sit behind my computer and print money because I am smart. What did I say last week? Rising tide lifts all egos. I've seen it happen. I've seen people do crazy things. I see people hit it just right and absolutely print money. So you will have to go through a print money phase, but more importantly, you're going to have to go through a phase where you couldn't hit the side of the barn if you tried. You feel like you're, you're snake dead or you, you don't know what's – you begin that introspection process. And then hopefully you come out of it and realize that, well, wait a minute. Let me draw that big blue arrow in the market, and it's going completely sideways. This year has been a tough year for me. The winners have been a little – too few and far between. And it's been a market of grind it out, grind it out, grind it out. And I don't want to digress too far. I know, too late for me, right? But you got to be careful when you're benchmarking yourself to anything. You need to benchmark yourself to yourself. Write that down. Benchmark yourself to yourself. If you're following your methodology and you're taking the best setups and you're paying attention to conditions, then pat yourself on the back for following the process and forget about how well you did or whether or not you did so well. But you will have to go through that grind it out phase. And this year has been kind of a grind it out market. You lose, you lose, you lose, you win, you win, you win, you lose, you win, you lose, you win. Sound like Jackie Mason. It's been a Jackie Mason market. And what's tough is when you do have – I'm trying to think of the, uh, the year, but uh, was it 2013 or 2012? One of these years where net-net, the market looked pretty good. It was up whatever percent, but throughout the year, it looked like this, okay? You ended up here, but it was all over the place. Shorts didn't follow through. Longs didn't follow through, but the overall market rose. And that's been sort of the market this year up until the last several months where you could point out that, okay, now we just chop back and forth. But before that, it was a hard benchmark to beat because it did go up, but it had some pretty serious spills in between. So I was Googling, not Googling, but doing a search on patients on my website. And this was a slide I talked about a while back. There's two forms of patience that you'll need, getting back to the talking about the patients. you got to let the market come to you and then once it does you got to wait for the market to move now, this is where the wisdom of Liz Livermore comes in it was never my thinking that made the big money for me it was always a setting now I just read Livermore and this time on my reread I could see in this context he was talking about sitting in open positions, but they're also, as you've heard me talk about before, there are many people that have also said his point is also that you're waiting for the proper conditions. And if you uh, say reread Livermore, because I'm sure everybody here is, is read it, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, he talks about one point where he had blown up and I think he waited six months before making his trade, his next trade. But during those six months, he had studied the market intently. And not that you want to trade where you can't afford to lose, but from coming from that standpoint, instead of trying to make something happen, he waited six months, and then he came back in with a vengeance. Now, money is made by sitting, not trading. And this one, I guess, could go both ways, too. You're either sitting in a position, letting it unfold, or you're waiting for conditions to improve. You know, Doctor's Creed comes to mind. I almost said this in today's market in a minute. When your net-net price change for several months in the market is unchanged, then what's the Doctor's Creed? And I forget the Latin on that. I've, I've got it written in one of my blogs on the website on my articles but in a nutshell it says first do no harm so you can first do no harm to your account 
by waiting for conditions to improve. Another thing he said of many things that are of great value, don't give me timing, give me time. This is one that I recently have come across again, and it really struck a chord with me. A man may see straight and clearly, and yet become impatient or doubtful when the market takes its time about doing as he figured it must do. The market does not beat them. They beat themselves because though they have brains, they can't sit tight. This comes back to patience. So the man that could be right and sit tight is uncommon. And again, another Livermore-ism. And here's a case in point. You guys see me do these dead money reports all the time. Here's a case where we had a nice persistent trend. We had a double top knockout, which is a form of a TKO. And we had an entry, and we had an initial profit target. We had our risk all defined. Initial profit target was hit. Profits were taken. And then the stop was trailed higher. Now, this position took off and then died. Two weeks in the trade, three weeks in the trade, you're barely making any money. Tries to take off again and then dies. You're making money, but you're not increasing your money. Then finally it takes off. And it died. Try to shake you out. Okay. Took off again. Pull back pretty hard. Took off again. Felt pretty good about that. And then what happened? It imploded. And I forget what this uh, slide was here. Peak the trough. But that was a substantial hit in your open profits. And then what did it do? Well, it took off again. Chopped around, chopped around, tried to shake you out. What did Covell say? Like riding a bouncing Bronco. Then took off again. A little bit of a pullback, took off again. And then a pretty serious shakeout last couple days. So it's tough to be right and sit tight. We have another one on that I didn't have time to put the slide up that's going absolutely sideways. But as I keep telling my people, that's okay. Maybe it'll turn into the mother of all dead money reports. You put your plan together, and of course things change, but you have to follow that plan. You have to see it to fruition. And it's hard. I know that. All right. Let's take a look at these questions before we start talking about If you guys want to start asking about stocks, we're getting ready to jump into the market. It has been a difficult to catch a good trend so far this year. Yeah, and when we look at the actual chart, we'll look at it. Bibliography, bibliography is what I was looking for. Thank you, Gloria. Bibliography. I thought that was a word, but I was a, I, it just didn't sound right. Howard says, G.C. Selden. Yeah, Selden, I think his book is called The Psychology of Trading. S-E-L-D-E-N, I believe. Patience and discipline to follow a plan. Yeah. Yeah, and it goes against it goes against human nature. And I would encourage you to find a style of trading that fits your lifestyle. I would encourage you not to day trade. And if you do day trade, make sure your intraday position trading is what I call it. Look to get on, look to get in and ride that trend as long as possible. You don't want to be making a whole lot of decisions. The more I learn about how the brain works, the more it confirms the things that I say, such as we're only wired to make so many decisions. Your amygdala is made to wake up, get you out of danger, and then go back to sleep. It's not made to be constantly poked and woken up and constantly frazzled because... From a physiological level, it will eventually can make you crazy. It, and it's been proven that nerves can actually burn out. It's a literal thing. You can look at the nerve endings and they actually look like they've been burned 
believe it or not. And this is why you don't see longer term career ER doctors, air traffic controllers, or anybody that's in that constant state of, I guess, arousal might be the word. And Dr. Robert Marr gives a good example, and, and I've observed a lot of animals out here in the country. And I was, this is kind of silly. I was watching a rabbit the other night, and Mara's right. You know, it's like a, a bird hears a noise, like a twig snap or something. It flies up to another branch, like, ah. And then what does it do? It just sits there for a little while. Nothing happens. Goes back to singing or whatever it was doing. I was watching, like I said, a rabbit the other night right around dusk. And he, he heard me. He looked around. And I just was still. He didn't see me. And he went right back to eating the grass. Same thing in the in African plains or whatever. The animal gets spooked, makes that flight or flight decision. And if he realizes he's in no in immediate danger, it immediately switches off. Well, the problem with us in life is we're under this constant stress where we're not switching that off, and that creates a lot of problems. So find what works for you. The, my original thought in all this was, Busy traders make good traders. You don't have to quit your day job. In fact, I would encourage you to keep your day job. And as I've said, ad nauseum, people who have struggled actually became more successful as they became more busy in their day job because they don't have time to take mediocre setups. And I know when I first quit my day job, my trading went down the toilet because I was sitting there all day trying to make things happen and that every little tick became something much bigger. <laughs> MAGA. Make, make America great again IPO. Uh, we'll take a look at that. All right. All right. Um, a couple of weeks ago or a month ago or so, I started talking about winter is coming to the Game of Thrones fans, which I have become in more recent years. I wasn't early on. But now I'm all in. You'll know that that winter is coming quotes comes come quote comes from the Starks, especially that bastard Jon Snow. And then last week I said, well, is it delayed? Because it seemed like the market was headed higher in spite of everything. And then what? Early this week we shrugged off Harvey, a nuclear bomb, World War Three, all kinds of stuff, right? Well, now I think we need to pay attention. Or I should say we need to continue to pay attention. And the reason I'm saying winter is coming is like that kind of has an indefinite time to it. I'm not calling a bear market. I'm just saying there will be another bear market. And as I've said in recent presentations, both here and, and outside of my own website, I want to get ahead of this. And more importantly, I want you to get ahead of this, and I want you to pay attention to developing situations. If everything goes on and makes new highs, then we dodged a bullet. But if we start seeing more and more signs, then we need to pay attention. You don't need to go crazy bearish, but maybe fire off a short or two and definitely honor your stops on the long side. So it's better to be safe than sorry. I guess I need to take this slide out because it's been here for a while. It's here. A couple of years in the works, trading full circle course. Go to my website, two trade stocks successfully, or on my homepage, I think you'll see this uh, little video here. If you click on that, you'll get the first four videos, I think, in the series. And it's good stuff, I'll say so myself. All right, I think I've pontificated enough. Uh, let's go ahead and hop into the uh, live charts. All right, I want to just briefly go through the overall market. We'll take a look at a few sectors, and then we'll hop into your stock questions. Keep them coming. The Psychology of Trading by Brett Steenbarger. Yeah, I think I have that one. I think that's the one I'm currently reading, or one of the ones I'm currently reading. It's on my nightstand. Um, and... I think the original one was the original one with that title was written by Selden. 
um, two completely different books, obviously, two completely, you know, 100 years apart at least, maybe 120 years apart. But yeah, uh, Steen Barger is someone that I probably should have put in that list of people earlier, but I didn't discover Steen Barger until more recently. And uh, he definitely deserves to be in that list, though. And uh, he's a good read. And I would recommend you you definitely read him when it comes to training psychology. Absolutely. Charles Kurt uh, often references Steen Barger, and that's probably where, uh, through the Kurt report, it's probably where I found, if I had to say how or where I found Steen Barger. And I've just begun to read his books, and I have his, uh, I also have some audio books from him listening to, as time allows. But yeah, good stuff from him. And it makes a lot of sense. And you know, as far as it being a lonely sport, as I said earlier, such as Dr. Robert Morris saying we need to reach out and have other people and have a support mechanism. But as far as being a lonely sport, the more you study trade psychology, the more you realize that everything you're experiencing is normal. And it's going to give you more and more confidence. I just got stopped out of something as I was going live with this presentation. And it's the, the old me would be pissed off. Not that I'm not upset, but it's like now I'm kind of like, well, that's part of the process. It happens. Let's focus on finding the next setup. And it's the way you, you look at it and phrase it. But through all this psychological study and all these things that I do publicly here on my education, in my educational business, it's helped me to embrace more and more these things and to embrace the attitude and how important your attitude is. And how you just have to shout next, you know, drop an F-bomb if you must, and sometimes I do, but then move on. Reach a point to where a loss is just a loss. And it's frustrating, don't get me wrong, but then move on 10 seconds later. All right, let's take a look at the S&P 500. Obviously, today we're down a smidge in here. Uh, I mentioned Jackie Mason earlier. This is a Jackie Mason market. It's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's kind of all over the place. One thing that I've been noticing in more recent times is we do have a little bit of a head and shoulders top working. Now, I mentioned Schaubacher and Edward and McGee earlier. A friend of mine actually met, I think McGee, one of them, got on a train way back in the day and, and – uh, Went and met him. Kind of interesting, um, interesting individual. Both of them, both my friend and McGee. But anyway, um, read those classical technical analysis texts, but be careful in trying to implement them directly. Find something simple, and if that dovetails in with that more complex pattern, such as a bow tie within a head and shoulders or a first thrust within a triple top or a double top or like a double bow tie off a big double top, these type of patterns. But don't try to trade the classical technical analysis in and of itself, okay? Very important for you to learn it and incorporate it into your trading, but not... Don't try to trade it in and of itself. I think you can get into a lot of trouble in doing that. So have a signal and then back it up with the classical technical analysis, like a like a bow tie off a huge long base down at all-time lows, saucer base or something that going way back in time, McGee, Edwards and McGee or Schaubach or one of those guys. But don't try to trade in and of it in and of itself. Now, along those lines, the reason I'm saying that is we do have a potential head and shoulders working in the S&P 500. Not the end of the world, but obviously you don't want to see the bottom of this range. And let's just 
make the math easy. Let's just say 2,400. We only see 2,400 get taken out. And you know what? For S and Gs, let's just see where the 200-day moving average is. Not quite there, but it's getting there. Usually a level you don't want to see get taken out. There's usually a moving average is right in there with it. Let's plot the 50 in case fills here today. And then I'm going to move a little faster. Trust me, I'll stop pontificating so much. No, 50 is pretty high. But the 200 down here, and that should be a level that's not taken out. Not that it's line in sand, but if it gets taken out, you might want to pull in your horns a little bit. In fact, as a general statement right now, you don't want to be too bullish or bearish, but you want to be concerned because we haven't gone anywhere in a few months. So that's a little concerning. We're still not too far from all-time highs, but unfortunately, you have to get there. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. NASDAQ off a smidge today, obviously. You could draw your, or I guess up a smidge now. You could draw your sideways arrow there, too. So we go back to June, June, July, August, Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Wednesday. <laughs> uh, you can see we're going sideways for quite a while. So that's a little concerning. Speaking of concerning, the Rusty is the, the biggest concern of mine and has been for a while. One, if you didn't know anything, you certainly could look at it and say, well, how far have we gone since last year? Not very far. Okay, depending on what day you pick, we're actually down a little bit. But when you zoom in, you can see that we had a thrust lower followed by this retrace rally. And so far, I think it's just that, a retrace rally. One day at a time, though. But this has me a little bit concerned. Now, I think we were just under the 200 there recently. Let's plot the 200. We're below the 50, as you can see. Let's change that to a 200. And, yeah, we're back above the 200-day moving average. Nothing magical about any of these averages. And I only plot the 50 and the 200 when the market starts looking a little dubious. And maybe we're just coming down here to kiss this 200-day moving average. We still have a positive slope in the 200-day moving average, so that's certainly a good thing. And this might have turned, might just be the mother of all consolidations. Now, I hate to use the word hope, but what I've been hoping is that we break out and this becomes the mother of all bases and we have one massive leg on top of this base. Now, in the sectors, there's some dubious-looking areas such as the banks. And we, we kind of have a bit of a sloppy bow tie working here. And I'll show you a tighter one uh, in a second. Coming off of all-time highs. So this looks a little concerning. I would keep an eye out for some shorting opportunities in the bank. You know how you get rich on the short side? But you might make a little money if the market slides. And... Right now, I'm bearish on insurance, and I think we have some shorting opportunities available, and we're going after one in here, which I'm sure one of you guys will mention at some point. And, but you can see it's beginning to break down from high levels. We could have a bow tie. Well, we have technically we have a bow tie now, but it's more of a first thrust type of setup. As I often preach, you want to look for the first thrust first, just in case the bow tie takes a little while to form. Now, material constructions, if memory serves, a little bit cleaner bow tie, as you can see, kind of came together and spread out over a short period of time. Let me clean this chart up for you. And kind of a bit of a throwback in here, but so far, still looks pretty ugly. There's your inverted saucer and handle, if you want to look at it like that, or cup and handle. So that's what I mean by a cleaner bow tie. Now, some areas such as biotech doing okay so far in here, but certainly not accelerating higher. You had this big thrust higher, and now they're in a bit of a drifting mode here. So I would like to see some acceleration here. And we are along some biotech-related companies, or at least one for sure in a model portfolio, and I'm along an IPO here. Semiconductors, as you go through these, and I would encourage you, go through all two, 239 of these uh, Morningstar Industry Groups or whatever group you like to look at. Semiconductors, 
Got a top, a top, a top. That's kind of a triple top-ish looking pattern. It's not the end of the world. If we go on to make new highs, then we have averted that. And we're not too far from new highs, so let's give it the benefit of the doubt for now. But you want to pay attention. Uh, take a look at the transports, first thrust down. Now coming up and bumping up against a little bit of resistance in here. So that looks questionable. So it depends on where you look, but for the most part, most areas looking a little dubious. Metals and mining has been waking up lately, and now they're breaking out to new multi-year highs, so we could start seeing some new setups there, which would be great because these stocks could trade contra to the overall market. As a general statement, I like commodities, especially when they're coming off of major, major lows like we had back here in 2016. As, and I don't like them as much when they're at mid-levels, but if they start trending again and breaking out, then we may be forced in on these. Gold, the commodity, has been uh, waking up in here, maybe thanks to Kim Jong-un or whatever reasons, but nice little rally higher so far in gold. It's been kind of wide and loose and all over the place, but certainly waking up. So maybe if it makes new highs, we'll start seeing more and more gold stocks begin to set up. And really, without going too far, there's a couple of areas that looked okay recently, such as defense. But you can see even defense now has lost a little steam in here. It just looks like a pullback. But on a net-net basis, it's losing a little steam. You can see it hasn't gone anywhere in about a month. So we'll have to keep an eye on that situation. And again, go through as many of these as you can stand. You'll see that it's pretty much mixed. What is my view on Edward Thorpe? Is that Van Thorpe? Um, if memory serves, some of this stuff is uh, is okay. I don't agree with everything, and I, I guess you, you wouldn't expect me to agree on everything. But um, some of this stuff is, is good. It, it, I'm reading a book now. Um, it's actually called Psychology of Trading. It's SFO, Stocks, Futures, Options, or whatever. And I think there's some Van Thorpe in there. And I'm not uh, – I don't disagree with it. But Edward Thorpe, is that someone else? But, yeah, I'll reread uh, – what is it? Uh, i got a few Thorpe books here I have to read. Uh, you know, it depends on when I read something as opposed to how, as, um, how much it inspires me. So – so he might have a lot of good things in it, but it's just been a while since I read some of these uh, things. And as I reread them, I'll certainly mention them. All right, let's open it up for individual issues. MAGA, Make America Great Again. Make America, IPO. I don't have that on my list yet. Is that a real IPO? Yes, it's PGR. PGR, yeah, what did I tell you? I told you somebody would pick it out. This is a setup for today, and it just triggered. This is progressive insurance. And Steve says, is it a first thrust? Absolutely. And it just triggered, as you can see. Okay. Now, first thrust, a little bit slightly more advanced pattern. A stock needs, A, a sharp sell-off relative to its volatility. Now, this is only about a five-point drop eyeball on it which isn't that big of a drop okay maybe 10 percent or so oh, we can measure it i forget i can do this yeah 10 percent. look at that pretty good eyeball but the hv in stock's only 17 so that's a significant drop based on the volatility of the stock also with these first thrust type of patterns ask yourself if you were in longer term trend falling mode would you have gotten stopped out and i would say yeah, probably. Now, again, you're not going to get rich on the short side. Uh, it's probably found a little support around 40. That gets you swing trade out, a little trailing stop. You know, maybe this is good for 10 points, which percentage-wise, I guess that's okay. I'm not a huge fan of the short side, but, hey, I take I, I play the hand that's dealt. And, yes, I think that's worth a shot. Absolutely. High five. How's that? First high five. First stock of the day, first high five of the day. Oh, uh, Edward Thorpe, um, was he beat the dealer? Uh, was he the guy who did the um, – wasn't he the guy who did the um, – he, he was a blackjack player and wrote the blackjack books, and then he became a trader. Um, 
I need to I need to see if I have any of those books here. I don't remember reading them, but I think it might be worth uh, reading. I'll do some. I'll find out and let you know what I think. You know what I think. KL another strong gold stock. All right. Yeah, uh, this is one that's on my momentum list. And, you know, maybe a nice little TKO or something might be worthwhile in this one. But you can see it's up towards brand new highs. Um, when you have such a strong trend, it's going up so much. I like to see the mother of all TKOs. A big, strong sell-off first. The trade is PhD. Passionate, hungry, dedicated. Absolutely. I agree. Good point, Howard. All right, Donald wants to know about HCC, TKO, the gap down. HCC. Well, first of all, yes, I hear what you're saying. I usually don't like a setup that has a gap in it, but this is a coal stock, I'm guessing, since it has the word coal in it. But, yeah, that looks pretty good, actually. Um Pretty persistent trend, TKO. So, yeah, good job. I'd almost see, like to see a tiny bit more knockout move, but, yeah, it looks pretty good. I wouldn't – that's a small gap. I wouldn't get too excited about that. INDA? No. Uh, put it on your momentum list, but it's it's down, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. Jackie Mason stock. Thorpe follower of John Kelly, Kelly Asset Allocation, Pound Snow Book, Futures Fortunes Formula. Is Kelly a Kelly formula? The Kelly formula is great if you knew that your system would always perform in a certain manner. In other words, if you knew you had an exact edge, okay? And as I've said before, Larry Williams, I hope Larry's okay. He's down there in the middle of uh, Irma, poor guy. Um, Larry Williams won a trading contest where he won a where he made a million dollars in one year, but towards the end of the year he was actually up two million, and then he finished the year up one million, and that was his initial claim to fame. And the way he did it was he was using the Kelly formula. Well, I don't know the exact formula. Larry McMillan actually explained it to me once, and that's how I learned about how Larry Williams did what he did. But basically, it's based on how correct you are, and you bet at a very big size based on that. And it'll work really well. It's, it's the fastest way to ever make money. Unfortunately, because markets aren't normally distributed, when things begin to unravel a little bit, it, it won't work. OK, and, and I don't want to I don't want Mr. Kelly coming after me, but that's my take on that. IAG on a pullback, that's going to be a, a gold stock. Yeah, you can see some of these golds are waking up in here and he was like, well, Dave, how come we not all over them? Well, back in 2016, if you go back and look at the service, we were going after some of these. But you can see the trend got pretty ugly throughout in fact there was no trend and we're all over the place but now they're beginning to break out again we could see some uh, decent setups and pullbacks so absolutely put that on your watch list amen to busy traders hey dr tony's here dr tony is a uh, good buddy yeah enta but yeah it's People often become successful when they just get busy, busy, busy. You know, my story there was back in uh, 2000 or whatever. Printed money in 1999. Started writing a book around that time. And then I reached a point where the market began to turn and I was still still trying to trade the last bull market. And then I realized I was actually going against some of the things that I believed in just because I was looking for that continual action and wanted to. I wanted to continue to wake up and see how much money I made overnight. And as I've said before, I got so damn busy with the book and everything, and my trade wasn't going so well, so I backed off a little bit of my trading, and then all of a sudden something wonderful happened. It's like I reached a point where I couldn't stand it anymore, and I only took the best of the best trade, 
trades. And that actually helped me to become a much better trader because I realized, like, wait a minute, I don't have to be trading like a banshee all the time. Maybe I could apply a little bit of this Pareto principle, a little bit of 80-20 and focus on the 20% of the trades that are making 80% of the money. Another lesson. Uh, this one looks okay. Wide and loose, longer term. Some overhead, longer term. It's in biotechnology. Biotechnology is doing okay. A little bit of a gap higher. It's okay. It's not bad. Okay. You can certainly do much worse than that. But certainly not bad, John. SGMO. I always say Sachimo when I see this. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, it needs a little bit deeper pullback. Uh, put it on your watch list for sure. For sure. A uh, little wide and loose at times, but it looks like it's got its act together. Maybe on a little bit deeper pullback, but yeah, put that on your momentum list. Absolutely. Bizon and RDFN worth a second look. Well, Bizon was on the Landry list and was actually a setup recently. With a TKO... Let's back the chart out a little bit. I like to see that this was a double top knockout. I like to see a market get spanked with a TKO, and then I like to see it go right back up really quick. Okay. And let me draw, it might be easier to draw this on a chart. So, what you want to have happen. As you got a nice trend, maybe a, a persistent accelerated one. And you want to see a TKO, something that sticks out like a sore thumb. Something that if you're busy saving doc, saving lives like Dr. T, you, you would say, you know what, I have to take this. You know, keep that guy in a respirator for a little while while I go take this trade. He'll be all right. <laughs> Roll him around a little bit. He'll be all right. Uh but once you have this knockout move, what you want to see is you want to see something like this because everybody who got shaken out, if it goes right back up, they have to do a bit of a put up or shut up, okay? And if it does go straight back up, their put up might be way up here, and that might cause help to accelerate the market higher and more of a parabolic move. Also, any eager shorts that shorted somewhere in here now are faced with that cover or lose their butt. And then again, that might create help to create a parabolic move. If the stock begins to meander like this, then a lot of times this trend knockout could actually be more than just a knockout. It could be the beginning of something much bigger. So getting back to the charts... Ideally, when I put this on, I said, and I even said, hey, guys, if this is a trigger within a few days, let's take it off. You can go back and look at the, you can go and look at the archives for those who aren't on a trading service. Uh, get on delayed. It takes me a couple days to, to update it, but, and then check the homepage of my website, which might be a little bit more current on that. In the middle of the homepage, there's a, I have the trading service delayed. But you can see, instead of going right back up and triggering, it's kind of been meandering, and now it's kind of working its way back up. So in this particular case, you, sometimes you just have to be willing to let them go. Yes, it might trigger and take off, but so what? We'll go out and find something else in the meantime. But if it makes new highs and then pulls back again, then yes, possibly. In RDFN... No, um, I would pass on RDFN. RDFN just kind of barely triggered and then it came back in. It, it does, I hear you on this one, it does have that look of a deep retracement, but I would pass. And um, for now, for me, this one have to break, make brand new highs. Somebody's asking me about AKCA again uh, for us, any. Um yeah, I would wait for the next pullback. Not that I wanted to pull back. I am long this one, full disclosure. But on the next pullback, I think it might be worth a shot. Quat on a pullback. Quat, did you say? 
Reminds me of an inappropriate joke. <laughs> uh, not yet, okay? Ideally, you want to see a market go higher and then accelerate higher, not go higher and then decelerate higher, okay? So it's going to need acceleration and then a pullback. So let that go. Uh-oh, F and Don is here. F Don. Don wants to know about Ford. His favorite stock. No, it looks like Electrocardium Graham. Try to bottom out. I hear you, but it's going to have a lot of resistance to deal with. Low. Yeah, Donald, that one, the one that starts with H, is on the Landry list for today. It's actually set up, so we're going to pass on that one. Um, low looks like it's in trouble, but it's kind of all over the place. If you're going to short something at this juncture, uh, sort the banks or insurance companies. I mean, see how clean this is coming off of brand new highs? Looks like they're in a, a, a shat load of trouble as opposed to something that's a little wide and loose. So try to find some of the cleaner that's imploding. CAI. Yeah, that's a good looking stock. Uh, needs a little pullback, a little on thin side, but not too thin. It's not bad. I'd almost like to see it accelerate a little bit and then pull back, but yeah, put that in a momentum list, but it's not set up just yet. CISN for James. Never heard of it. Um, yeah, on a pullback. Absolutely. Nice. See, there's your acceleration higher. See, it kind of took off, and then now it's kind of like, um, you know, I've experimented before. Like, there's got to be a way, like, first gear, second gear, third gear, where stocks just kind of work their way higher, accelerate, then they have that third acceleration higher followed by a pullback. I don't, th I don't want that's, that to sound like Elliott Wave or anything, but that's something that I've watched over the years. GNRC for Don. Yeah, there's no setup there yet. It's kind of wide and loose longer term. See if it can keep breaking out and then maybe uh, play a pullback. XOMA. Uh, longer term, this one has problems. There's other things you could do in biotech. I hear you. It's kind of melting up. but And I would leave it alone based on the magnitude of that move recently, too. Oh, you're welcome, Russ. A-R-W-R. -R. Sounds like a Scooby-Doo stock. Ah, uh, I know it's a while back, but I don't like stocks with all these bad memories. It's in biotechnology. I think you could probably find something better in biotechnology to go after. And by the way, let's not forget the market's kind of sideways. MAGA is a REIT ETF. It just sort of traded today. Okay. Well, you got five days on that before anything else, before doing anything. you got to wait at least five days for an IPO to trade. Adam, this one's kind of all over the place. It's obviously an IPO. I would let this one make brand new highs and then go after it, okay? Um, let's see if it was something... Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. I guess you would have been a buy here, but then it imploded. Yeah, wait for new highs on that one now. Wait for more of a secondary type of setup. Glue? Yeah, that looks good. Good job on that one. Who says that? Donald? Uh, why in this longer term? Let's just wait and see how it shakes out. I probably would pass based on longer term action, but I can't argue with the fact that it's headed higher. Maybe on a pullback. Yeah, CO. CO is one I've been watching. It's crazy. Um, I actually would like to see a little bit more pullback in this one just because of the magnitude of its move. But, you know, here's the thing. We talked about keeping it simple. It should be obvious. Your setup should be your, your trend should be obvious. You should be able to draw a big blue arrow on the chart. And then what's your successful trading existing trends? And, of course, you might look to trade, venture into trading, trend transitions, emerging trends, and things like that on things of that nature. 
but this is an obvious trend, a persistent trend. So absolutely, look for a TKO on that one. When that one has a TKO, I'd be all over it. Um, I wouldn't jump in right now, but I, I hear you. Um, you could certainly do a lot worse by trading something that's not trending. You could buy Ford. That would be a lot worse. <laughs> Are we back to picking on Don? Any guy, anybody remember that classic? Um, used to pick on Don in here a lot. Play to take advantage of weakening banks, FAZ. Well, the only problem with these, um, there's a lot of problems. One day I'm going to start a hedge fund, and all I'm going to do is short these inverse shares, okay? Why? Well, because they go down longer term, and there's a variety of reasons for that including tracking errors, but one thing that I never thought about until more recent years is that if these, when these stocks are short and they throw off excess cash, they have to reshort that excess cash, and that reinvestment at lower levels eventually makes them go lower and lower and lower, and that's why all of these short ETFs will eventually go to zero. And you think, well, let me just buy them when they're down low. Well, they'll reverse split you to death. Trust me, I've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. If you don't know what that is, just buy them when they're cheap. You'll learn. Um, and the other thing, too, is it's three times leverage. So you would have it does you no good if you're following a solid methodology and a solid money management, a robust money management plan, because – you would have to divide your risk by three and buy one third of the shares because of leverage. You have to take the leverage out. Yeah, unless you want to make a day trade in something like this. Let's take a look at like an hourly chart. See, we've got like an hourly bow tie or something. You know, by all means, if you want to take like an hourly bow tie, let's see if we get an hourly chart on here. You know, an hourly bow tie and you just want to make a day trade, uh, intraday position trade, I should say then maybe, you know, you know, like back here, you had a bow tie, like right here, get in right here, exit by the end of the day, get in right here, exit by the end of the day, get in right, I guess right here, and then exit by the end of the day. But again, I want to talk you out of day trading, and I shouldn't have showed you that. But the reason I showed you is that's about the only time you would ever want to trade one of those Triple E leverage, stupid things. JNCE, not bad. You got a nice thrust from lows, a little bit of a pullback. You got some overhead supply. That's a ways away. I'd prefer if it didn't have it, but it is a relatively new issue. So I'm going to give you an okay on that one or not bad. It's probably also a bow tie. Close enough. It's a bow tie, first thrust. It's okay. All right, let's get uh, – Ken wants to talk about RADA. All right, Ken, thanks for waiting patiently. Yeah, this looks pretty good. And, you know, longer term, you have some acceleration higher. You see it kind of worked its way to here, and then it took off. Yeah, that's not bad. I mean, that's – uh-oh, we got a problem. Does have a lot of overhead supply. Now, I know that was a few years ago, but keep in mind that markets have long memories. I almost gave you a high five, except for this overhead supply, and maybe I'm being too much of a perfectionist, but it looks okay. Maybe just a little bit more knockout move, but I think I would pass based on the overhead supply. But good eye there on that one. I have to give you a credit for that. ABEO is going to be a biotechnology stump. Yeah, that looks good. Uh, needs pullback, though. And it's got some bad memories way back here. Play. Did we talk about that one? Uh, if you want to short this one on a bounce, maybe, but you certainly don't want to buy that. Don't catch a falling knife. ESIO. Um. Want a little bit more of a pullback. We've got a lightning round here because we're almost out of time. Adam, did we talk about that one? Yeah, we talked about that one. 
TRVG is going to be a possible short, or was a short, I should say. Uh, no, there's nothing to do with this one, and it's too late to short it, so leave it alone. It's also hard to borrow sometimes, these IPOs. TCON. This looks okay. It's really thin, though, uh, or fairly thin, based on its uh, price. It has a lot of overhead supply to deal with along the way, so I would pass based on that. I hear you. It's bottomed out. If you didn't have so much overhead supply, possibly. Okay, race. It's going to be Ferrari. It's another one of those. Uh, what's his name? Scooby Stocks. Would not qualify as knockout because of the gap down. Well, it's tricky um, because it's a foreign stock, obviously. Italia. Um. Yeah, I think I'd pass. Sometimes these foreign stocks could gap because it's trading overseas. But it has lost a little bit of steam in here. It's just not jumping out at me as something that I'd want to go after. And with the gap, where would your entry be based on the TKO? I mean, if you had to go after it, minimum of 115 before I'd, I'd look to get back in that one. You're welcome, Howard. CLMT. We're on the cusp of the uh, time limits here. Yeah, this looks okay. Uh, big gap down back here, so you, you might in some bad memories, so people might be looking to get out. Uh, I would see what else you can find in the energies that are bottoming out. There are a few cheaper energies that are bottoming out right now that might be a bit worth a better look. You know, Maybe on a knockout move, but longer-term bad memories might keep me out of that one. You're welcome, Steve. Steve says, thanks for a nice webinar. Well, thanks for attending. I appreciate that. You're welcome, Don. All right, looks like we're we're at the uh, time limits here. As usual, I want to thank you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Anything unanswered, daviddavelandry.com. If we don't talk again between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. And then I guess uh, we'll talk again next Thursday, if not sooner. Thank you so much.